All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We still have some people hopping on, but we are past the top of the hour. I wanted to thank you for joining us and welcome. This is our third installment of a Lunch and Learn series. Uh, this month's program is on leadership, culture, and collegiality in the post-COVID law firm. Uh, my name is Denise Damasio. I, along with Debbie Yu, chair the Law Practice and Legal Department Management Task Force for the Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section at the ADA. And we welcome you. And uh, if you have questions during the program, please utilize the chat feature. And you didn't come here to hear introduction, so I'm going to turn it over to Sandy Boyer, who will introduce our panel, and we can get started with content. Great. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you with us. We have three great people on the program today to help us talk through this conversation. Uh, Megan Glucio is from the Christie Law Group in Seattle, Washington. Hillary Fox is from Allstate Insurance in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Chuck Roberts is with Performance Management Group in Lakeland, Florida. And they're going to kind of do a three-person panel discussion regarding the topic. So I, uh, Megan, I think you might start out. Yes. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Coluccio. I'm a partner at Christie Law Group in Seattle. Uh, we are a small firm of about six attorneys, and I think we have seven or eight staff members. Um, our firm focuses primarily on civil rights defense for municipalities and law enforcement. Um, for me, I, I think I offer a somewhat unique perspective to this topic in that I became a partner February 1st of last year. So basically right as we went into this remote workplace. Um, so I, I didn't get the traditional, I guess, trappings of that transition. And by that, I mean, you know, there, there was no formal leadership course or firm management um, CLEs or, or trips that some of the other partners in my firm uh, traditionally have taken during that transition period. And I found myself kind of thrust into this leadership and supervisory role, uh, right as everything in the world changed and we went into a remote working environment. So I, I'm, I've been forced to learn these new skills in a remote system you know, from a distance. I'm not getting that face-to-face -face contact with people in the firm. And that has certainly been a challenge. Um, it's been a unique challenge, I, I think, for a lot of people. Um, it, it's surprised me personally how challenging it has been because I am very introverted. Um, so at first, I didn't think that missing Seeing that face-to-face -face everyday contact with folks would be something uh, that I would find is actually extremely important to how a firm works every day. Um, I think our firm has transitioned well, uh, but I think another challenge that a lot of folks are finding in this environment is, okay, we've gone remote. We have this Zoom platform where we can see everyone face-to-face. But I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, Zoom fatigue is also a real thing. Um, so we got to a point in the pandemic where we were regularly having firm meetings on a weekly basis where everyone would hop on and we could talk about caseloads and all, all of that. And we were balancing that out with trying to schedule like fun, firm, happy hour type events. Um, but at some point, everyone kind of hit a wall and we kind of fell off our mark there. Um, so that, that has been a challenge uh, that we have found that that face-to-face -face contact, whether that be in person or over the Zoom platform is really uh, crucial um, to how your, your firm survives. Um, so that's, that was kind of my introductory comments. I'll, I'll pass it off to Hillary. Thank you, Megan. Hi, everybody. I'm Hillary Fox. I am a long time old TIPS member. Um, and I really miss seeing everybody at meetings. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had all my Facebook memories. It's like this week, we tend to have the mid-year meeting somewhere. So this year it was, oh, you were in Austin at this this week last year. And 
Uh, we were in San Diego a few years ago, um, Houston, Miami. It's just, oh, I mean, it's fun to see the photos, right? But also kind of a kick in the gut. Like you're never going anywhere any ever again. <laughs> so got to pa- push past that um, and stay positive. But I have a little bit of a counterpoint to Megan's experience. I, um, as you heard from the intro, I work for Allstate Insurance, so a you know gigantic multinational corporation. Uh, I manage the legal office here in Minneapolis, which is a smaller group. But you know the the law and regulation department within Allstate is you know, 1500 some people. And it's a little bit of a unique situation where you, you know, I kind of feel like I'm the manager of my group and I am, but a lot of the decisions that affect my group are made, you know, by very important people at the top. And I don't have any input on that. I just have to roll with it and deal with it and, and implement the, the direction. My office is closed. My office will be closed till at least July and it could extend beyond that. And it's difficult to not really know what's going on and when are things going to change. And from a leadership perspective, this has been tremendously challenging. Um, I did have a few more years than Megan had in a leadership role, but I'm a gigantic extrovert. I thrive on seeing people, being with people, talking with people, you know, I get energy from that. So Zoom fatigue is indeed very, very real. And it does not give me the same uh, level of endorphins and dopamine that, you know, a face-to-face meeting gives. So that's been something that I've really had to challenge myself on. Um, but that's how I, I, that was a big part of my leadership style. If someone has a problem, I want to sit down and let's hash it out. And now the hashing on the Zoom is, it, you've just had to find a way to, to make it effective. A few things I have done to try to help with that, because I don't know about you, but when we started out with the Zoom, I just felt like I'd lost all my powers of of um, reading people and of observation and really kind of getting at someone who's really struggling because you miss all those little body language cues. So I, I mean, I feel like I've, I think we've all probably improved on that out of necessity, but that's still a barrier, I think. So I've just, I had to establish weekly or biweekly one-on-ones with, with all my team because in a big group meeting like this, like we have now, I can't exactly scroll through the entire, um, you know, attendee panel and catch the, you know, grimaces or the eye rolls or whatever the case may be. So I just, I've needed to get each of my team members just one-on-one on on screen so that I can hear the fatigue in their voice or see the frustration in their face. And that's been a, a, a good way to combat the lack of human contact. So maybe that's something that resonates with you and, and something that you could take home um, to your team. So that's a, a how I've kind of changed my leadership style for the COVID era. In terms of culture, I've had to sort of circle back on what made my team my team before COVID hit. And I manage a group of trial lawyers. We can't try a case right now. Uh, my office services Minnesota and Wisconsin. And other than a brief two months interlude, we haven't been able to try a civil case in either one of those states in almost a year now. So that's also taken a lot of brainstorming, flexibility, a real, um, you kind of got to get past the narratives you tell yourself that we all have very ingrained. You know, I'm a trial lawyer. I go to trial. I don't, you know, a binding arbitration is, you know, wimping out. I've had to get past that because we need to get our cases resolved. Our clients don't want to sit around and wait till we might be allowed back in the courtroom in 2024. We, you got to look at, you got to take a fresh look at the alternatives that are 
available to you. And you know that applies to everything, not just how you get your cases resolved. But you, we all kind of look at ourselves a certain way and look at our teams a certain way. And you, I, th I think it's counterproductive to remain enmeshed in those things that you think are such a huge part of your identity because they just, they've been taken away from you. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. <coughs> and in terms of collegiality, this, this is dumb. Maybe don't take your, this idea back to your team. But the second full day that my team was working from home was happened to be my birthday, which happens to be St. Patrick's Day. And I just thought I'd, I ran across a stupid meme about Irish people drinking whiskey. And I emailed it in the morning, like, hey, happy St. Patrick's Day. And I just kind of got a laugh out of everybody. And that it just turned into this thing. Every single morning that I'm online, I don't do it if I happen to take the day off, but I send a meme and I just, you know, obviously I try to make it funny. Sometimes my sense of humor is a little <laughs> lackluster, but try to find a meme, you know, obviously not vulgar and stay away from politics, things like that. But it's just, it kind of gets the day off on a light note. And let's, that's kind of my signal to my team. I'm online, I'm working, give me a call, shoot me a Teams message. But it's just, you know, if, if I've forgotten, you know, I kind of get, you know, wrapped up in something right away in the morning and it's, you know, getting later, I'll get emails like, where's the meme of the day? And it's just kind of a goofy thing that I didn't mean to turn into what it is, but it's um, kind of just a little, you know, piece of glue or tape that's sort of holding my team together. You know, like Megan said, we've done a lot of the Zoom trivia and Zoom you know, all, all the things you guys know. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of forced and awkward and it's just not the same, but I would, you know, you got to find what works for your group, but it's, this is a weird time, but ultimately I think it's, I'm hopeful that we'll kind of come out you know, stronger and grateful because you've just really had to look at every aspect of your business and your team and how you lead. And it's, um, it's good to get, you know, to have to shake things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hillary. Chuck, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, and I'm going to start for just a moment with the last thing that Hillary just said, which is that you've really got to look at every aspect of your team. I would encourage you to view what's going on now as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to really do some things to strengthen your team and to improve your firm's performance. And the reason for that is the unusual conditions that we're experiencing now amplify every little problem that already existed in your organization. So the little things that you could kind of let slide are now brought to everyone's attention. And it's an opportunity for you to use this to identify what those issues are and address them so that you'll not only be able to function in a superior manner now, but you know, given the day when this all returns to a little bit more normal conditions, you'll be a much stronger and much more profitable firm anyway. Um, that, that said, let's look at what the opportunities really are. The number one issue in any organization, and this is even before the pandemic, <clears throat> if you were to ask any HR director, you know, what is the number one issue that employees identify as being in need of improvement? It's communication. And <clears throat> so this is one of those things that that dramatically gets amplified uh, with the situation where, as one of you mentioned, you know, you can't read the body language. It's a little harder to read people's expressions and that sort of thing. You really need to keep the communication focused on the other party. And what we found through our research is that more than 99% of all people think, write, and speak backwards from what is the most effective approach. And that is they're very focused and centered on themselves. So you've got to keep the communication focused on the other party that you're communicating with. And um, 
it's really not about the quantity of communication. It's about the quality of time that you have with the other people. So I encourage you to still make sure you get enough communication by deliberately establishing times when you're going to get together. But it has more to do with what you say and how you say it when you're, you're having these interactions with them. And something else that uh, Hillary said that really caught my attention is the, the feeling that there's not as much information perhaps available. And when you lack information, people start using their imaginations. And this is a very, very dangerous thing. Most people's imaginations conjure up situations that are far worse than reality. So the more you can share actual information with people about what's going on, what other team members are doing, what the organization's doing, what this client's doing, what that client's doing, the better people will respond because they're responding to facts and not their imagination. So that's something to keep in mind when you're communicating with them. And then, um, you know, from a cultural standpoint and what makes your team identity, uh, one of the best things you can do <clears throat> is evenly distribute workload. If you've got somebody who's not, who's used to trying cases, they're not getting to use uh, to do that, is have a mantra, like a mantra, like, what can I do to help? And look for ways to support each other. You're going to find that, you know, Megan, you might be busy this week and Hillary's kind of slow and the next week it's vice versa. You can find ways to support each other, keep the workload more um, manageable and share, share in the efforts, share in the challenges, share in the solutions and things like that. You know, people are always smarter as a group than they are as individuals. When, you know, when I deliver presentations, a lot of time I'll give these exercises where we, uh, you can even do something as simple as a vocabulary test. The, the group will always score higher than the individual because we all have different backgrounds, different experiences. So help each other solve problems. It'll give you something interesting and challenging to do and help you work more um, as a team. I agree, Chuck. I, one thing I do want to note, because I've experienced this with my team too, people absolutely will fill in the blanks when they don't, when they have insufficient information and they're going to fill it in poorly or right. neg negatively. But I think leaders need to be careful to balance that with things are changing constantly. I mean, literally this week on a particular issue, you know, we got direction A on Tuesday and then Wednesday I told my team and then this morning and now it's different and you know I really wish that wasn't the case and maybe wish I wouldn't have shared as much as I did not I didn't know it was going to change obviously but I think you know leaders need to worry about running into credibility problems so it's a judgment call and you're going to make the wrong one on occasion but if things seem nebulous um, maybe zip it until they, a little, they are a little bit more solidified so that people don't feel like they're getting jerked around even more than they already are. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, <clears throat> you know, that's true anytime you're leading change is uh, <clears throat> information is, can be very powerful in getting people aligned and alignment is the key to maintaining productivity. Uh, but yeah, you don't want to look like you're oscillating. Uh, what that does is it undermines confidence and leadership. And once people lose confidence in leadership, then you've got a whole different battle that you've got to fight. Uh, to both Chuck and Hillary's points, again, I, I, I have found that communication is certainly key, especially in terms of workload. Uh, our office has been fortunate to actually be busier than ever. Um, but if you're not communicating with one another about said workloads, things can become off balance, right? And as a firm, as a whole, you're really only as strong as your parts. Uh, so what I've found for me personally, again, challenge of kind of being an introvert in that management and 
supervisory role that I also need to speak up. Um, we're a trial firm. We identify strongly as trial lawyers. We're not trial lawyers right now because <clears throat> nothing's really going to trial. Um, and you, you don't want to become too wrapped up, I guess, in, in that identity. That's something that I've struggled with um, personally. Um, you know, who am I and what am I in this environment that, that we're living in? Um, so I think adaptability is key in, in terms of how, how the firm moves forward. Um, I'm not in it on my own and I need to communicate that with the other partners, the other attorneys. Um, and I need to check in with my partners and with the associates and what do they need right now? Um, I, I think that everyone can become so focused on, on their work because I guess in some ways we have the benefit of time uh, to do that. And by that, I mean, we're not having to rush off to court. We're not traveling for depositions, um, but that, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you're in less. Um, so if you're not communicating it, by having, I guess, weekly meetings, I've made a, a point to check in with staff members, with the other attorneys to see where they're at. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, again, depending on your organization, we're not seeing each other in the office every day and we're new to this remote environment. Um, so you could go a couple days a week without talking to someone in the office, which is very unusual for a small firm like mine. Um, so you, you communication again, like Hillary and Chuck have pointed out, I, I think is key, even if it's hard for you <laughs> as an introvert. So if you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're in a supervisory role in particular, I would encourage you to make a little matrix that has the list of people that you have reporting to you and have a schedule to make sure that you're reaching out to each one of them and not forgetting anyone every so many days. And you may, you may find that because of your case you're working on or something, you're talking with one person all the time, but you don't wanna neglect the others in your group. So especially if you're in a supervisory role, keep a schedule of how frequently you talk to people. And I would even put a little plus or minus next to the interaction, the date of the interaction to keep track of, do they seem to be doing okay? Do they seem to be struggling? You know, a lot of times it's not just, are they doing okay or struggling with the technical aspects of what they have to do, but how are they emotionally? You know, not everybody is wired to work in isolation. Not everybody has a good work environment at home. Uh, so you've got to be able as a supervisor to provide that extra encouragement and extra support. Now, the fact that you're not being able to try cases, this again is an opportunity for you to use what time you have to practice your skills, become more proficient so that when you start up again, you're an even better trial lawyer. It's, it's kind of funny, but, um, you know, I guess... When you, when you learn skills, you practice them on the job, but very few people go home and practice these skills. It's your opportunity to really elevate your skills. Look for things you can do, and even in terms of training, and get uh, use this as an opportunity to elevate your professional capabilities. It'll help you once things get back to normal. Let me mention one other thing, too, and that is, you know, we talked about issues being highlighted um, because they're amplified during COVID. Very, very important um, that your firm make sure, make sure that you have a culture of accountability. It's difficult enough for many firms to enforce accountability in the office, but when people are working at home, it creates this big gap between those who are self-motivated and those who are, are not. And you've gotta be sure that you hold people accountable. Uh, there are techniques that you can use to do that. The best type of accountability to have is self-accountability, which you can encourage by having them um, write down their own commitments to you and even sign it. Uh, they're much more likely to follow through when they do that. 
But one of the biggest issues that you have with your star performers is star performers love accountability, the others don't. And so when you don't hold people who don't perform accountable, that breeds resentment in your star performers and you don't want that to happen. So you have to be willing to enforce accountability even remotely and there has to be consequences for when people don't live up to their commitments. I totally agree, Chuck. I, we do, we just have to meet everybody where they are, right? You know, I, some of my team is fortunate to have, you know, a, a bedroom they could dedicate at home to their workspace and with the door to shut and, and keep the dogs and the babies and everybody out and, you know, kind of have more privacy than they did when they were in the office. But, you know, others, other members of my team have got four kids at home all distance learning with a you know a distance working spouse and it's it's been chaos so really had to learn to um, you know extend some grace and understanding and just sit down and really brainstorm with people you know what can we do to make this better for you and accountability is part of it some people are super great at I'm gonna get up I'm going to follow my schedule. I'm going to work out. I'm going to shower. I'm going to have coffee. I'm going to sit down and log on by eight o'clock every day, ready and raring to go. Some people are like still watching Sports Center at, you know, 10 o'clock, 1030. So, and, and maybe that's okay. I think we all have had to learn to let go of our expectations a little bit. And if you got a person that needs to, you know, watch some morning TV and then they're going to get their stuff done later in the day, that's fine, man. I, well, I want you to get your stuff done, right? That's why I hired you. I did not hire you to come sit in your office here in front of me from 8 to 4.30 every day. I've never cared if you are doing your work in your pajamas from a, you know, wherever. Just do your stuff, right? And that's been hard now, especially I'll say with, um, you know, the non-exempt employees because they've never in, in our organization until now had the opportunity to work from home. So it's been a big adjustment. And, you know, Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. The initial trust is a little bit harder to come by sometimes with, with certain people, but I mean, it, it's right. The, the people who are doing, doing their stuff will get mad if the, if it becomes apparent and it will that people aren't doing their stuff and they're getting away with it but again that's harder to do on on zoom and you know like a lot of leaders on the phone i've got my own zoom calls all day long i can't be checking in on you know checking in with people all the time i've pretty much trained my team to be very um, uh, liberal with their use of the status function. Of, we use Teams um, at Allstate. I know there's other programs, but you know you can say, "I'm busy. I'm available. I'm on a call." Even if you're just going to run out for lunch, just let let people know what you're doing. Um, it, it's helpful, and then I won't call you if you're if you say, "I'll um, I'll be right back," or "I'm in a call." Um, and I've kind of asked for that same grace and courtesy you know for myself to my team so one other thing that chuck mentioned sorry about when things you know this is all an exercise to kind of find the the weak points the weak points it's been a good stress test for your organization for when things go back to normal i think for a lot of us this is it's going to turn out that this is normal now a lot of organizations across the country have made the determination, wow, we really don't need all that real estate, as it turns out. People are doing just fine. And, you know, various reiterations on that theme. So I think that's, A, something you got to come to grips with, that we may be, do, be, be doing most depositions on Zoom till kingdom come. Um, you know, acceptance is the first part of recovery, right? But it's hard. 
that this this isn't what a lot of people signed up for when they went to law school. You know, people, a lot of people love that office environment and the, the big team meetings and the, the parties and the happy hours. And a lot of that is just never going to come back, I think. But we'll find, we'll, we'll find some good replacements. I have confidence. <laughs> Chuck, it, when you talk about opportunities, um, one of the things which is different than where Hillary is, but in, in private law firms where you have lawyers that own, the, that own the firm, it seems like these opportunities go just beyond your own practice, but it's how do you keep that firm in business long term uh, and develop the young lawyers into owners in the business. Do you see that changing based on what's happening with COVID? Just to be sure I understand your question, you mean how you how you get them interested in in becoming partners, or how you get well, them? Well, you have to keep that collaboration going, right? And so, if what Hillary says is true, and we aren't going to go back to the in office um, event, you know, every day meetings, that type of thing, how do private law firms continue to build that collaboration and collegiality to ensure the firm moves on? It's not a major company; it's owned by its partners. Mm -hmm. You have to keep those people together to keep the firm effectively functioning. Well, you know, what's kind of interesting is, um, and you know, I have a, a daughter in college. She's a lot more comfortable with all this than I am. And what you're going to find is the, the younger members of the firm are much more accustomed to this and much more comfortable with it than, than those of us who are a little bit older. So it's not as <clears throat> it's not as big a shock to them, I think, as it is to us. Now, does it affect social development? Absolutely. Does it affect uh, your ability to, you know, have real teams? As long as you're taking steps to deliberately create those linkages and those networks and that reliance on one another, you can overcome that. Uh, now it does it does mean that you have to you know make a little bit different kind of an effort to train people and to groom them to be ready for leadership positions. You know you can't just uh, mentor people in business development the way you used to because it's done completely differently now. So you're going to have to educate the next wave of people who are going to be partners as to how do you be rainmakers in this new world. It's a completely different uh, skill set. Now, the same, you know, underlying principles applies to how do you sell professional services, but but your techniques are going to be very different, and you got to be darn good at it because the amount of labor you're going to spend trying to bring in the the work has got to, you know, be such that it enables you to be profitable. And I, I really believe the the key to profitability for law firms in the future is not so much what you do externally in the markets, it's what you do internally to be productive. And again, this is a real test as to how you do that. And I can give you a simple example. It has to do with <clears throat> how you allocate work and how you assign tasks. If I have four tasks, that need to be done and I want to delegate those to someone, I have a choice as to how I, how I do that. Let's say they both take 80 hours and they're both going to be over a four week period and they have the same due date. <clears throat> I can give all those assignments to one person at the same time and say, you know, I want you to show progress on all these and get them done by the due date by assigning them in parallel or I can assign them in series. And if you assign them in series instead of parallel, you'll find that they're able to get the work done much quicker. And the reason for this is we're reducing the reliance on multitasking. Multitasking is a myth. It doesn't exist. The human brain can only do one thing at a time. And so what happens is every time you multitask, you're just rapidly switching from one task to another. But research done by um, some folks out in California demonstrates that when you switch from one task to another, it takes on average 23 minutes and 15 seconds to completely reorient yourself. So if you switch, let's say you have four tasks per day and you switch, you start out with one and then you switch three times, 
at the end of a week, you're wasting about six hours. Let's say instead you, you organize your work so you're only working on two tasks per day and alternating them every other day, you're still gonna waste about two hours per week, but that's a difference of four hours. You've now recovered four hours of time per week. That's a 10% improvement in productivity. That's huge. That means you can finish a job 10% faster. That means if you're doing lump sum work, instead of charging people by the hour, you can make 10% more profit. So these are things that are very, very important in terms of how you can operate your firm in a way that has nothing to do with the outside world. These are completely within your control in order to be much more profitable, much more, uh, much stronger firm. To Chuck's point about kind of putting projects together, I guess, in a series rather than a lump, some all together, I've found that is particularly useful in kind of getting new associates up, up to task. Mm -hmm. uh, we hired a new attorney kind of in the middle of this pandemic. So she's new to the practice. She's, I guess, more technologically sound than perhaps some of us, maybe a little more comfortable in this environment that we are in. But again, not being in the private law firm environment, which she wished to practice in when she went to law school, it, it looks different. Um, and that's certainly challenging from a mentoring standpoint with a new lawyer, while they might be very familiar with this kind of remote setup that we have, you don't get the side-by-side -side mentoring that I got when I was coming up. And that was invaluable to my development as a lawyer. I mean, how do you learn this stuff if, if not on the job and now you're learning it in this weird environment that's new to everyone? Um, so my approach to that, even given kind of my own struggles in this new supervisory management role is to just kind of give off bite-sized tasks because that's easier for me to manage um, and work with her. It's, it does in the end take more unbillable time from my day, but I think in the end, that's going to be the most uh, value add for the firm because otherwise I could say, I need you to get these five things done on the file. You know, look, look at the file that's come in, draft an answer, come up with a plan, put together a status report, and I'll talk to you in a month. You know, they're just going to be drowning and, and not have really any oversight on that. Um, so while, while giving small tasks one at a time ends up using a little bit more of my time during the day, it's been, I get a better work product in the end and the associate learns a lot more because we can have a dialogue easily if we're just talking about one thing. So, so let, me, uh, let me mention a couple things. Um, I do think you can still have the side-by-side -side mentoring no different than you do in person. As a matter of fact, I, with another professional organization, I'm in a mentor mentee or mentor protege program. And I have weekly mentoring calls with somebody um, and it's, it's no different than sitting down next to them. We can share our screens. We can work on documents live together. I mean, thank goodness the pandemic's happening today and not 15 years ago. We'd be in deep trouble if it was 15 years ago. You know, business would come to a screeching halt. But we have the tools today if you, you know, if you really want to use them to have a side-by-side -side mentoring session just as you would in person. Um, the other thing that's really, really important, and, and this goes back to amplifying the, the general issues with, with any firm. And if, if you don't mind, I, I want to share my screen with you for just a second. Is that okay, Sam? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me share something with you. I want to share two different things with you. 
Okay, can everybody see my screen, this chart? Yes. Okay, this is a modified version of Blanchard's situational leadership model. They, um, the problem with the model they developed is it, it doesn't tell you when, when to use certain techniques and it's upside down and backwards. So I've, I've re redeveloped it. And the key is you've got to figure out when it's appropriate to delegate work and how much coaching and support you need to give somebody. And it's a task dependent supervisory skill. You might have great competence on one type of issue and you're very committed to doing it. And if that's the case, I can delegate to you. As a matter of fact, I'm better off delegating and not giving you too much detail or that's gonna offend your, your sense of worth. Uh, but unless you're, you're, you're delegating a task that they're very familiar with and they're committed to doing, you need to not delegate, but provide support or coaching or direction, depending on where they're at relative to a specific task. So that's that's one thing. That's has that's a basic supervisory skill. You need that whether we're in COVID or not. But again, it's going to amplify. COVID is going to amplify amplify the importance of this. Now let me show you one other thing too. This is about alignment. And Alignment is a lot like two-dimensional vector addition. If, if you look at these black ve vectors, they have both magnitude represented by their length and they have direction represented by their arrowheads. And so they represent the efforts of individual people. You can see some people work harder than others by the length of their arrow. If the blue star is our goal and that green arrow is the sum of all those efforts, you can see you've got a whole bunch of people working, but they're not a accomplishing a whole lot. It's not going very close to the goal, nor is it going in exactly the right direction. Now, the cool thing about both organizational alignment and vector addition is it doesn't have to be perfect. Look at this bottom section with just a modest improvement in alignment. Look at the difference in that green arrow that's the sum of the efforts of these people. It's tremendous. So this goes back to how you communicate again and your supervisory skills with getting everybody aligned along a common purpose. And it's not your mission. It's not your vision. It's not your values. It's purpose. You have to have a common purpose that you're working towards. And if you can get this kind of alignment improvement within your organization, it's tremendous in terms of what you can get done with your available resources. And you can become much more a stronger organization, much more positive oriented, much more profitable. I really like that, Chuck. And that reminds me of something I've tried to institute in my team huddles. You know, at the end of the day, my group is responsible for protecting the interests of our policyholders. And we forget, I mean, we all do, that these are real people. I mean, to us, it's just a file and you get focused on the plaintiff or the opposing counsel who's a jerk. And it's easy to kind of lose track of the real person that we represent. So I've encouraged in my huddles for someone to just tell a story. You know, I had this phone call with this client this, this week, or I got a really nice email from a client after we got the file closed. Just to keep circling back on that is our ultimate purpose. And that is our ultimate job. And I think that's, that's helped. Um, we've got some really good client satisfaction scores. And I think it's helped to... Um, keep keep pointing the arrow because <laughs> it's easy we're all we're all just torn in so many directions every day but if you can keep uh shining the beacon in in what it is we're doing here people i think that that can help morale it can help workload it can help work flow motivation everything so i like that a lot i think that's a really good point hillary i really like keeping the focus on who it is you're really trying to serve and you can do that in any practice, any practice Absolutely. that you practice in. And in a private firm, you know, insurance company, corporate, doesn't matter. It's looking at the end product and the end person that you're trying to service. Yeah. And Disney is a great example. Um, you may be parking cars, you might be picking up trash, you might be serving food, but Disney's purpose is to create happiness for other people. And everything that everybody does at Disney is focused on that singular purpose. Megan, any thoughts, you know, on that topic and your work in a, in a small private firm? 
Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, doing some insurance defense work, we kind of talk about like the triumvirate. Are you serving the insurance company? Are you serving the client? Um, and I think that that is such an important focus is, again, what goal are we working towards? We're serving the client ultimately. And, and what's what's our purpose in all of this? So keeping your eye on that prize, um, I think, is crucial uh, throughout the process. And everyone in the firm plays a role in that. Um, everyone's a part of the team. It's not just the lawyers. Everyone is serving a role. And again, it, it's for that, that one goal or endpoint. I know we're winding down a little bit, but one thing I wanted to talk about and get Megan and Chuck's perspective on and any questions from the audience is the lack of boundaries now between work and home life and how we can all do better with just computers always there and I'm always home. <laughs> so I must be able to work from the time I get up till the time I go to bed. And I struggle with that so much because I want to set a good example. I hate it. I really, really make an effort to not email my team at 5.58 a.m. or 10.58 p.m. because I think it sets a terrible example that I expect them to be doing that. You know, I was a horrible role model in 2020 for using my allotted PTO days and it, it showed my team was terrible too. I only had a couple of people use all their days. And one of them, you know, I have them do self-assessments at the end of the year. And one of them even said, I only use 12 of my 30 days. And I'm like, woman, that is not <laughs> something to brag about. And I, you know, I, I'm, you know, we're already into the second month and I, I haven't taken a day yet, but I, <laughs> it's a goal of mine in 21 to be, to lead better by example in that regard. But I don't have any great ideas um, other than, you know, I've seen in, Harvard Business Review or something, people literally like might get in their car in the morning and it, may, it might just be driving around the block, but that kind of sets the, the beginning of their workday and then do it again at the end. Um, I haven't tried that and I, I actually do come into my office a few days a week, but I know a lot of people are struggling with that, that are home a lot of the time now. So I'd love to hear um, Chuck and Megan's um, great solutions. <laughs> That's something that I absolutely struggled with in the last year, you know, just it, it's this nebulous thing, right? We're not, I'm not in my office. I, I live in a small condo, so, and it's open, open concept. So I'm literally in one room all day. Mm. So there's no delineation between work and home for me. Um, and at the start of the pandemic, um, I don't have any kids my teammates do, I was happy to kind of, you know, I, I'm here, I'm here to work. Let me help lighten your load while we go through this transition. And I just kept working, 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 working. And I didn't take time. Um, I had kind of the mindset like, you know, we'll be out of this soon enough. And, and that's when I'll, I'll use my time off. That's not healthy. That's not good. That was not a good plan. Um, I think your point, Hillary, about kind of indicating to your team where you are on either Microsoft Teams, like I'm on a call, I'm off. That has become important to me. Like if I'm gonna take a day, just like a mental health day, I might, there's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go, but I'm not gonna work. I will block that off on our calendar and other folks have taken to doing that as well. Um, Cause everyone in the firm can see the calendar and people are really respectful of that and they, see that so like over the Christmas holidays people took you know the week between Christmas and New Year's and, and everyone respected that obviously if if there's deadlines and work needs to get done you have to address that but that's one I don't know if it's a solution but it's something that's worked for our office I know we're a smaller uh, firm than some others but um, you know, really, again, communicating that and continuing to check in with people um, and letting, letting them know, take the time. 
Um, we've been in this for a while. I think everyone is fatigued and, and that is really important. Even if we can't take a vacation and go somewhere, just being at home and not doing work, uh, it's worked wonders for me when I have had the occasion to do that. Um, so I'm making it more of a habit to really block out that time. And frankly, other members of our firm and the staff really encourages that because it lets them know that they, they can do that and they should do that as well for themselves. So um, let me add to that a little bit. Um, I've worked at home a total now of 14 years on two different occasions. The last run has been 10 years. And um, my wife, my daughter, and I are, are uh, a little bit of workaholics to begin with. And uh, so we're probably bad examples of that. But I will tell you that the thing that has worked for me is, and, and you know, this depends on your setting at home, of course, and that is having a distinct area that you call your office. And preferably an area that has a door. So that when you're done, you walk out the door and close the door. Um, I also use a laptop all the time. I don't use a desktop computer. When I'm done at the end of the day, I close my laptop and I put it on the shelf. Hmm. So there are little things that you can do like that to mark the end of the day. My, my daughter's having to do her college at home. She walks to class by walking around the block, you know, to provide that kind of demarcation that that's the end of this class. Here comes the next one. But the other thing I will say about <clears throat> working at home that I think is a, a lot, many, many challenges but one of the real benefits is flexibility. And, and it kind of goes back to, I think, maybe Hillary or, or I can't remember which one of you mentioned, somebody watching a sports show in the morning. It gives you the flexibility to do that. Now you have to be available when other people at your office need you for meetings and things, but it allows you to take advantage of things that you can't do otherwise. If you have a hobby that requires you to be outside, and during the winter time, it gets dark, you know, it's dark when you start work, it's dark when you're done. If you're working at home, you have the luxury of going outside for two hours in the middle of the day and doing whatever your hobby is, and then working the extra two hours at night, you know, if you're keeping track of hours. But, um, but the point is, it gives you other benefits. And I think the real key in all of this is looking for the opportunities, looking for the benefits of our situation. It's not what happens to you that counts. It's what you, what you make of it. So look, look for the ways to get the most out of this situation. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I get to spend an extra year with my daughter. She's taking school at home. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sad that she's missing the, the experience of being away at college, but I love the fact she's home. So look for the positives. I have, I have to say that uh, I, we're building a house right now. So I'm living with my daughter when I'm in Michigan who has three grandchildren. And I thought at the beginning of this, wow, it's great. I can play with my three grandchildren all the time. But now I play with my three grandchildren all the time. And I seem to be babysitting <laughs> them a lot, <laughs> which is really great. But you know, <laughs> you still got to shut that door at some point. <laughs> but anyway, does anybody on the call have any comments or questions or thoughts regarding the conversation that we've had? We always like to hear from others that are on if they're interested in sharing. Uh, I have a comment. And first of all, it's just to thank all the participants. But I really think you hit on a lot of the key challenges that we all face. And I have a younger son that is out in the well, he was thought he was out in the work world, but now he's working um, <laughs> from home. And, and he was the one that talked about putting that off time on his calendar, even if it's a, uh, you know, an hour a day to walk the dog or, and so shows a lot of wisdom there, I think, because um, I can relate to what Hillary is saying about just having work there all the time. And my first job out of college was not in the law, it was not in the legal business, it was in the sales business where I worked from home and uh, I swore I would never go back to that because I just worked all the time because, you know, I was in a one a studio apartment and my work was there all the time. So um, 
that, that is definitely a challenge. So I think there was some good suggestions on that. I think it's also important along those lines, if you're managing people or you're, you're training associates, it, to let them know it's okay as well. We can put so much pressure on ourselves to work, at least I'm with you guys, 24 seven when I'm at my house. Uh, and so a lot of people feel that way. And just to be told it's okay to take that time in the middle of the day, because we know your goals are set and it doesn't matter, like Hillary was saying, if you get them done at eight in the morning or you get them done at eight at night, as long as you meet those goals, so you feel like you're progressing and you're not just stuck in a house and doing work, but you're progressing towards something. And so I think Hillary was really great when she said to let people know also, it's okay for them to take that time and relieve them of that constant pressure of working from home. Denise, do we have just three more minutes or where are we on the? Yeah, we have about another three minutes. And if nobody has any uh, more comments or questions for our panel, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Debbie Yu. I see a question in the chat. Um, you okay to address that? Uh, they were saying that all speakers in the entire conversation was very informative, inspiring. I would like a transcript of the conversation. Uh, there's also a question about explaining the parallel versus series models. Oh, I didn't see that. That must be just to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just take a moment. So the idea is if you have, um, let's say you have a couple of tasks that have similar deadlines, um, rather than giving them, you know, delegating them both or assigning them both to the same person at the same time, you hold one back and you say, here's a task. I need you to do this let them focus on that, they will get it done faster because they're not switching from one to another. Then when that task is done, you give them the next one. The, the important thing there is if you're ever doing this during times of recession, uh, people will tend to drag work out to try to look busy. So if you let them know that, hey, I've got another task for you, the moment you finish that one, that gives them the security, the feeling of job security that they can get the task done quickly and you'll have something else for them. Don't ever leave them thinking that when that one's done, you know, they're done. That's a great point. All right, Denise or Debbie? Yep, Debbie. on that note, uh, thank you all very much. Um, I invite the the audience out there to please join me in thanking the wonderful speakers. So thank you so much, Chuck, Megan, Hillary, and Sandra for a very informative lunch and learn. Um, and thank you all for attending. I, I know that I've learned a lot and I will try to create some boundaries. <laughs> and I don't know how I'm gonna do PTO since I'm a solo, but I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> so I'll report back. I but, have uh, one. I have oh, one final question for you. Does, does everyone who's attending have our contact information? So if they think of a question later, they can contact us. Uh, we could do a follow-up. And Norma, if you don't mind uh, sharing that information, if the speakers don't mind, uh, we're happy to include that information in a follow-up. Yeah, that's fine. Because somebody may think of a question three days from now, and uh, I'd be happy to, to answer your question. Thank you so much, Chuck. Definitely appreciate it. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, I want to also thank uh, this uh, Lunch and Learn series is being put together by the TIPS Law Practice Management Task Force, which Denise and I co-chair. And so if anyone's interested in joining us, uh, feel free to let us know. And we also have a TIPS Connect page, so join us. And you can uh, help plan and discuss uh, our next Lunch and Learn, which will be on April 7th, which is a Wednesday at two o'clock. Uh, generally, we are having lunch and learn sessions bi-monthly on the first Friday, but there was a conflict with another program. And so our next lunch and learn will be Wednesday, April 7th, uh, two o'clock Eastern. So, uh, so please mark your calendars. I'd also like to uh, thank the co-sponsoring uh, committees and task forces, which is a TIPS solo and small firm task force, the TIPS staff council committee, in the TIPS Committee on Outreach to Young Lawyers. So thank you all for co-sponsoring and thank you all for attending. And, and again, thank you very much to the speakers and uh, for your time and for the informative advice.
Uh, we all walked, walked away with uh, some great tips and uh, we should do a follow-up to find out how we're implementing them. <laughs> Accountability. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. So thank you all very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.